Welcome back everyone. In this video, what I want to do is talk about something very important called principal component analysis. And we're going to use something uh, very important within this, the PCA, and it's actually called dimensional reduction. And normally in these videos, I would, you know, start off doing some more theoretical stuff, but what I want to do is just open up uh, my data set and show you the data and then kind of explain uh, the theoretical piece to why we're doing this, but it's important to show the data set and then we'll come back and, and figure out what this is all about. So here we are in my Jupyter notebook and uh, we're calling it PCA example for now. And, you know, typically we have all of our import statements that we have and, and the new one I, we've, we've used before is uh, Seaborn. Okay, so I wanna just kinda get the imports out of the way. But what's more important, what I want to do right now is just look at the data sets. So I'm getting this data set from the uh, sklearn.datasets and I'm importing the load breast cancer data set here. Okay. And I'm just literally, I'm calling it and I'm assigning it to cancer and I'm using the uh, keys method or function here uh, so that we can see certain things about this data. Okay. So um, when I run this data, if I, if I call my print cancer and I'm, and I say, okay, let's tell me about the description. Um, what that gives me in here is from the data set. It gives me, um, as part of the file, this, this description of what's going on. Okay. And it's telling me that the number of instances, so the samples that I have is 569 samples. Okay, and then the number of attributes or features, to put it another way, is 30. Okay, so we have 30 numeric predictive attribute attributes and the class. So if I look at my attribute information or my feature information, uh, it gives me it gives me a good description of, of what's going on with all of them. It talks about the mean, standard error, worst all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and then I start to get into all of this data. Okay. So there's about 30, um, features to this. Okay. So it says missing attribute values, none. So it means that I've got everything, all of my data points that are in there. Um, uh, class distribution, this doesn't so much matter right now, but it will, um, because what I want to do is, is look at this different thing. What are my target names? So what are the two things that I'm trying to kind of classify with this data? And it really comes down to, uh, malignant or benign. Okay. And when I run this, uh, the second statement, so if I comment this out right here, and then I rerun this, this cell, sorry, I have to run these first as usual. And if I run these, my target names are uh, malignant and benign. Okay, so that's really ultimately what this data set is after. But if we get down even further in here, and we start looking at all of the features, you know, we've got mean radius, mean texture, mean perimeter, like, there's a lot. Okay, so what it's uh, with with head, you know, that we're only showing five rows but we have 30 columns. So we have 30 features that we're trying to analyze. And you can see it doesn't show me all 30. It actually, uh, it has this symbol here in the middle to say that, hey, there's a whole bunch of features in the middle that you're not seeing. Um, but there's all these different features within this data set, right? So it becomes very, very big. So if I go down here and I look at it on a scatter, uh, this is just an example of two of the features that I'm, I'm plotting right now. Okay. So what I want to do actually that that's not entirely accurate what I said, but we're going to come back to this. Okay. Uh, and I'll explain why. So what I want to do is leave the, this data set alone and get into the theory. And then we're going to come back and develop this idea a little more. Okay. So I want to look at this idea of dimensional reduction. Okay. And what are we trying to get at here? It, it it reduces the number of input variables in the data set. Now it doesn't delete them. It just 
further defines which ones are more important. So if you look at this particular example here, um, this data set, I mean, there's many, many more in this data set. I just copy or did a screenshot of, of this, but you can see gender, race, ethnicity, um, all the other columns. Okay. And if you're trying to maybe determine something like uh, entries uh, or chances of, of entries or something like that, a lot of this stuff actually is irrelevant to you. Okay, so I would say gender is somewhat irrelevant. Uh, race ethnicity group is irrelevant to actually just looking at quantifiable data to make a prediction of, of an entry. I would think that test preparation course, uh, math, reading, writing scores would probably be more quantifiable, especially in a data set that you're going to use for prediction. So this dimensional reduction doesn't delete the other stuff. It just focuses in on the important things. So if we look at um, this correlation analysis, we can now reduce our attribute attributes from eight down to four. Okay, and that's really what we want to do. And we're trying to get that correlation. So if you look at this now, you can see we're down to the four uh, attributes or four features is, a, is maybe another way of putting it. Okay, so um, we've got this pre-processing phase that we want to do. Okay, we want sort of less dimensions. So we don't want to be in, um, you know, 3D, 4D, 20D, right? We want less dimensions. And the reason is there's um, less computations and it takes less time. Uh, we want to remove redundancy of similar samples. Okay, so we we just we want cleaner data that's not repetitive. Uh, there's less storage of raw data that we have to hold on to. And again, that supports the idea of less computation in time. Um, we want our data to be much easier to visualize. Okay, it's it's how do you visualize 30 dimensions, okay? Um, and, you know, the most important thing here is that we are focusing on the most significant features. And then finally, you know, it's a better interpretation of our data. And that's really important, okay? So, you know, we have this other thing, this principal component analysis, so PCA. But we use this principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality. Okay, so we this is what we're primarily going to use to um, try to get it down actually to 2D. Okay, and this is how we increase our interpretation of the data set. And then, of course, the, the last thing is that it's really good for uh, minimizing information loss. Okay, so if we look at this uh, data set here, very small, very simple, just meant for illustration, right? Uh, across the top, you have sample, and uh, on the, the column on the left, you've got variable one, variable two. Okay, and this could be just as easily something like um, samples of math scores and geography scores. So let's look at this in a slightly different way. We've got our variable one here. Okay, and if we plot this horizontally, and we're looking at the values, you know, high being on the left, low being on the right. What we can say is uh, sample one, two, and three are both higher values than samples four, five, and six, okay? And four, five, and six lower, they're naturally gonna be on the right side. So we can determine that sample one, two, and three are more similar to each other because of the spacing between the two clusters than sample four, five, and six. Now, if we look at variable two, we can do this again and say, okay, different values, but same sort of phenomenon here. Uh, S1, S3, and S2 are more similar to each other than S4, S5, and F6, S6. Okay, so that's kind of clearly visible and it's the same thing in written text. So now we have these two sort of samples we've got, or uh, two variables, and we've got six samples. So if I wanna plot this on a two-dimensional graph, I'm plotting this, uh, these coordinate points by, by variable one, and I'm matching them up with their samples. So you can see the first group of uh, S1, two, and three 
are over on the right, they're higher in both categories and value uh, than you'll see with the, the second group. Okay, so that's these are all just plotted coordinate points. And we're using variable one and variable two to represent X and Y respectively. So what happens now though, if I have a variable three, okay, I've got more samples and you know, one extra variable. Well, now I can try and turn this into a, a, a three dimensional plane. Okay, and so now you're seeing um, that the larger values are further away. Okay, so samples one, two, and three are further away and samples um, four, five, and six are closer to the origin, okay? And of course they're, they're smaller values and that's why they're closer to the origin. Okay, so what happens now when I have four variables or four features, okay? So I can't really plot the 4D and above. Um, it's difficult, but the PCA can now plot 4D or more um, to make a 2D plot. And that's really what we're gonna talk about now is, is doing this 2D plot out of um, higher variables. So if we look at this data, uh, it does reveal to us a couple of important things. So it does reveal which ones are going to be the most valuable. Okay, and you can see this percentage score bes beside uh, PC1 and PC2. We're gonna come back to that later, but it kind of tells us which one is the higher value, which one becomes more important. The other thing is that it tells us that our similar samples uh, cluster together, okay? And you can see that here uh, just from the plots, okay? That's what that's derived from. And then the same thing for the other one. So we know that, you know, these, uh, the sa similar samples will cluster together. And we saw that previously on the horizontal sort of axis. Okay. And, you know, there's other things that it can tell us as well. And if I look at this, it can tell me because PC one is a higher value. It can kind of reveal to me that, um, uh, there's, Variable four separates uh, along the X axis better than the other samples that I have or the other variables. So it's kind of telling me certain things and, and we're gonna get a little deeper into this and you'll understand what I mean momentarily. Okay, so PCA reveals accuracy mostly in the two dimensional graph. Okay, so ultimately what we are trying to do is get our accuracy to the 2D uh, format. So it doesn't matter the number of variables we have, we're trying to get it ultimately into a two-dimensional graph. That's kind of our goal. Because when we get it to this state, uh, then we could do some really, really good uh, determinations. So the next really important thing that we wanna do is go back to these, the very first two variables. So we got variable one and two. And what we want to do is get the average variable um, value. So variable one, the average value. And we do this by calculating it, that measurement to uh, variable one. Okay. And then we turn around and we do the same thing for variable two. Okay. So just remember variable one and variable two are our X, Y coordinate. So this is why we're trying to get that. Now, when we get that, the averages of those, the really good thing that it reveals to us is that we can now calculate the center of those samples. Okay, so that's an important step here. So we no longer need the original data when we've got the, the center of the samples. Okay, so I'm just gonna move this over because what I wanna do is now sort of modify the way I'm looking at this a little bit because I have the origin now. I have a new origin that I, that I didn't start with. Okay, so the new origin is the center of uh, the average between variable one and variable two. Okay, and so when we when we look at this, what we want to do is get our line of best fit. Okay, so we start off in a random location, and as we start to do the calculations, we're we're moving around more and more and more until we kind of get this really good line of best fit. 
Now, how does the PCA know the line of best fit? Okay. Now, when we start off in the original position, we start to do this physical distance. We, we're measuring this distance uh, from that line of best fit that we randomly start with. But as we start to move around and we kind of settle on this, you'll notice that those distances actually get much smaller. Okay, so again, how does the, the, the PC know the line of best fit? And let's go back to high school. We're just gonna use sample two as an example. Okay, and in fact, we talked about this in one of the previous videos as well. The distance between my sample and my new origin is not going to change. Okay, it just doesn't change. It's a static uh, position that it's in. And I've got my, you know, line of best fit. This isn't the, the final one that we, we settled on. This is just a, a random line of best fit. And what we want to do is take a perpendicular measurement from our, our sample to right out to this uh, uh, line. Okay, and you can see what's starting to shape up. I've got my hypotenuse right now. And as you can see now, it's a right angle. So I've got A and I've got B. And if you, you know, think back to high school, uh, to our good friend Pythagorean, you'll see, you know, you remember the formula, uh, hypotenuse is gonna equal A squared plus B squared. And then you just take the square root of your, um, your result. And, you know, a couple of rules about this, okay, that we have H is always going to be fixed in this particular case. Um, because the other two are just a way of defining distances, right? But H is always going to be that distance from the origin, uh, of the actual sample piece. So we know that we can have some flexibility with A and B. So if we have an increase in A, it equals a decrease in the value for B. And likewise, if there's an increase in B, we decrease A. So one of the things that we definitely want to do is actually we we want to maximize the sum of the squared distance along a now there's probably no intuition about what i just said but let me show you what this really means okay we're going to manipulate a or we're interested in a as opposed to b or h okay and what we can do is we can take that distance of a and you can see that it runs along the red line and if i back up you see a is a red line it's it's on our line of best fit. So that's why we can manipulate that distance. Okay, and we have this D1 squared. Well, what does that mean? It's, if I look at the very first sample, S1, and I go from S1 and I follow my A distance from S1 all the way to the origin, I get this D sub one. And then what happens if I square that? Okay, nothing yet because we have other numbers that we have to do this with. So as I continue the, the process of measuring from S1 down to the origin, okay, and I, I kind of isolate that one momentarily, uh, and then I move on to the next one. Now I've got to deal with S2. Okay, so what's the distance from S2 to the origin? And I get D sub 2. Okay, and so we do this repetitively, okay, and then at some point we want to um, deal with the negative and the positive. So one thing that we're definitely going to do is we're going to square it so that the negatives don't cancel out positives or vice versa or anything like that. But you can see down at the bottom, we have our uh, sum of squared distances down at the bottom. Okay, so that's something that we have to do. That's a step that we want to take. Um, so again, how does the PC know the line of best fit? Okay. Uh, we, we continue this, we repeat this until we have the largest sum of squared distances between the projected samples of the origin. Okay, bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? Okay, but I wanna introduce this idea here. This is gonna give us our PC1. Um, that's a difficult word to pronounce, but it is actually eigenvalue. Okay, so what we're trying to get with all of this is our eigenvalue, and that is coming out of the sum of the squared distances. Okay. All right. So we now have our principal component one, or PC1. 
Okay, so that's the line that we've now determined. Uh, and that is our PC1. So we can slow, we can calculate the slope of this. And, you know, I don't know what the units are specifically, but if I say, um, you know, question mark or whatever units along variable one and units along variable two, this is how I would calculate the slope of this line, right? So the units along variable one seem to be longer. There's more of them. So variable one has uh, sort of a longer line to it. And if we want to look at this maybe uh, in an example, let's say that um, we have three units for variable one and we've got one unit along variable two. Okay, so this is rise over run. This is a slope. Okay, so three to one ratio. Okay, so variable one and another way of saying that would be X and variable two would be Y. So this is how we can derive the slope. Okay, and what this tells us though is that variable one is the greater variable. It's the more important variable because it's a larger number. Okay, and what we've now just determined was this idea of a linear combination of variable one and two. Okay, so this slope, uh, the values in our slope give us our linear combination between the two uh, variables one and two. Okay. So when we look at this a little bit further, I can plot this. So three on the, the bottom, one on the, uh, the vertical axis. Okay, and we, we can't just kind of leave it that way. We want to determine what H is going to be. So if I do the whole uh, Pythagorean theorem, uh, I left out the, uh, the symbol for the square root, that's okay. But what it gives us is 3.16. Okay, and what we really need to do now, though, is to uh, scale this. We need to make sure that H equals one. And the way that we simply do this is we take the, uh, the original value divided by the new value, 3.16. So uh, H divided by H basically gives us one. The other one is gonna be one divided by 3.16. And then again, three divided by 3.16. Okay, and this is going to reveal some numbers. So we have now a 0 0.32, 0 0.95. Okay, and our hypotenuse or, or whatever you want to say, it's actually referred to uh, an eigenvector. Okay, so our eigenvector, we have normalized it now to one. Okay, so that's good. And by doing all this stuff, we have this singular value for the PC1. Okay, it gives us this single number for PC1. Okay, these other two numbers are referred to as loading scores. All right, now let's look at this again. We have PC1, okay, and now what do we do? We, we actually want to get PC2. Now, how do we get PC2? The best way to do this is actually to do a perpendicular line of PC1 through the origin. And so it looks like this. It's just a right angle to PC1. But if I take my PC1 and my slope and I rotate it to be perpendicular, what it gives me is the same values, but it's rotated at 90 degrees. And now I know that my vertical distance is three, but my horizontal distance is gonna be negative one. So there again, what we end up with is one. Then we get uh, negative 0 0.32 and then again 0 0.95. So the values uh, numerically are the same, but there's now a negative in there. Okay, so PC2 is has an eigenvalue, which is now the sum of the squared distances between the projected samples and the origin. Now, what does that mean? Okay, if you look at it this way, you can see that those distances from the samples over to PC2. Okay, and the next thing that we'd wanna do is kind of plot all the PC1s and the PC2s uh, on that line. And once we do those plots to each of those points, uh, which you can see here, they're just the way they're, they're now assigned to PC1 and PC2 or all those points, 
What we then do is actually rotate it so that our, our PC1 is horizontal and our PC2 is vertical. Okay, and then from there we can use the samples to find the PCA plots. Okay, so if I just take one sample, you can see that I'm just matching them up and I'm finding the data point. So this one is going to be uh, S6 and then so on. All the data points will get plotted now onto our two-dimensional sort of graph. Okay, and what we've done now is created this idea of singular value uh, decomposition. Okay, that's kind of what we've done here. And, you know, the sum of squares distance PC1 is the uh, eigenvalue of PC1. And the same thing for eigenvalue of PC2. Okay, and now we can plot out our sort of distances. But if I if I look at this right now, and I kind of even eyeball it a little bit, and I and I you know, what's the number one thing, this point here, the first thing, okay, is that I want to measure the distance from S1 all the way down to um, PC1. Okay, the next thing I want to do is I want to measure the horizontal distance, okay? And you'll note between the two that the horizontal distance is a greater value than the vertical distance. So what does that imply for me? Okay, it implies that my PC1 is going to end up being the greater value. Okay, it's a it's going to produce a larger number. Okay, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're squaring and we're going to add them together. Okay, so, you know, as an example, let's just say, this is an example. Um, we have PC1 is going to, let's say, equal to 10, PC2 equals to 3. Total gives us a value of 13. But now we can kind of put those into a, uh, a variance or a percentage. All right. So, you know, when we look at this again, we say, uh, how far do their distances vary from the origin? Okay. And you might wonder, well, how, how do I kind of know this? So my sample size, okay, one uh, or minus one. So this is where this calculation comes. So as an example, if I said PC1 had a value of 10, um, this is what I would do. My, my uh, Egan value of PC1 being 10, okay? And then I'm saying N minus one, you're dividing by N minus one. Ultimately what it's doing is it's kind of giving us a numerical representation of which one is more valuable. And if you look at this intuitively, you should be saying that 77% is more valuable than 23%. Okay. There's this other idea here too. Okay. It's called a, a scree plot or some people, I like to call it a histogram. You might hear a different term, but if I plot PC1 and I plot PC2, I get the histograms of uh, the two variables. Okay. PC1 is 77%, it's a greater number, it's bigger, and it implies that it's more important because it actually is, okay? So now what happens here? What if I have three variables now? Because in the first example, I only had two, but we further complicate this if I add another variable to this situation. So what happens next? I have to create another plane. So I've got variable three. Okay, so PCA with three variables uh, is kind of almost the same as two, but it's a little more complicated. So now we want to plot it this way, sort of similar to the way we did the first time we plotted it. Okay, we want to, the first thing is get our the center of our data. Okay, so that's a really important thing that we get the center of the data and we're using PC1. Okay, and that's going to be our line of best fit to do this. Okay. And the next thing that we're going to want to do is, um, you know, just kind of confirm that before we go on, because, you know, with PC one, and we look at these different values, uh, for variable one, two, and three. And, and again, these numbers here, don't take these variable one PC one values to be sort of gospel. They're kind of placeholder examples, uh, meant to illustrate the point. Okay. So don't worry about where I get the numbers. But ultimately, my variable one, two, and three, this is how they shape up. 
Now, if you look at this, you can see that variable three has a higher number. So it again implies that it's a, a more important number. Okay, now what about uh, the next one? Which is the next one that is a, a higher number? And it's variable one. Okay, so what do I do there? I, I want to take my PC one and, uh, or I want to create PC two, and I'm going to do that because I'm going to take it from PC one. Okay. And it's a 90 degree or perpendicular line to PC one. Okay. Just like we've done before. Now, when I look at the reordering of this again, now I'm saying, okay, uh, PC two has these different values. I've got 0 0.71, 0 0.26, 0 0.18. Okay, so now I'm trying to create another line of best fit. So PC3 through the origin and perpendicular to uh, PC1 and PC2. Okay, so I know that this is starting to get a little bit complicated looking, but imagine trying to do all this stuff in four dimension or higher. It'd be extremely difficult. So how do we know the uh, number of, of PCs that we want? And, and it's really two ways of going about it, but you want to pick the smaller of the two. So you have one per variable or the number of samples, but try to take the smallest one that you have. And then once PCs are determined, uh, use eigenvalues to determine uh, proportion of variations. Okay, and really what is a, what is, what do I mean by variation? So let's say that uh, I've got three people and we are all six inches apart in height. You have somebody who's six foot six, somebody who's six feet tall, and then somebody who is uh, six inches shorter than that. The variance between the two is gonna be six inches. That's really what we're talking about with, with variance or variation, okay? So if you look at this particular graph, what you're seeing is I've still got my variable one, two, and three. I've got my PC one and I've got PC two. Okay. And you know, PC one has a, the highest value. It's the most important line on there right now. PC two is the second most important line. Okay. And we're looking at this both the reason there it's an order of importance is because of 77% uh, for PC one, PC two is 14%. Okay, but when we plot this third uh, line here, this PC3, we're only looking at really 9%. So when we get over to the histogram, we can see that, you know, PC1 and PC2 really make up the majority. It, it's a slight margin between uh, two and three, but really the majority is, is right in here. It's this 86% that make up um, the, the, all the value here. Okay, so ultimately, if our goal is to try to get back to a two dimensional thing, this is kind of good for us. So let's continue on. Now I can clean this all up a little bit. And then we look at this and we say PC one is 77%, PC two is 14%. Okay, but but now what do we do? We want to convert the 3D to 2D. Okay, we're going to remove everything except the data in, in you know, PC one and two. But the, the thing I wanna do here is just kind of plot all those points again. And, you know, same, same numbers, no change there. Um, but I wanna project the samples onto one and two. And what I have to do is actually rotate it. So I wanna rotate my um, PC1 horizontal and PT, PC2 to vertical, just like we did before. And again, I've, I've got my, uh, my, my samples on there and I plot them like this, the same sort of thing that I've done in the past or that I did previously. It's the same sort of thing. Okay. So we're the ultimate goal again is just to get all of this stuff plotted on, uh, a, almost an X and a Y axis. In this case, we're saying PC one and PC two. We're just plotting our sort of new points to our data. Okay, so this is kind of, uh, this is what the end goal is, is really meant to be. Now, again, when I, you know, look at this, I have now four variables and I'm, I'm not gonna go through it again, don't worry. But I can't draw it. 
Okay, but I can still do the math for it. And that's the important thing. Okay, and the beauty is the software is actually going to do all the heavy lifting. So not us. Now what we're going to do is go over and start doing some coding. Now I'm back in my Jupyter Notebook, and this is the example that I looked at at the beginning of the, the video here. And as you can see, I have all my normal imports still, Seaborn as SNS, uh, matplotlib inline. And we're using the uh, um, scikit-learn dataset import uh, load breast cancer. Okay, and when we look at all the keys here, uh, the key function gives us sort of all these different uh, uh, dictionary keys that we're, we're looking at. Okay, and I'm, I've all I did, you know, previous to this was print out what my target name was. And when I printed out that target, what it revealed to me were the two things that I'm trying to make a determination of, which was, you know, was it malignant or uh, benign? And of course, I just ran uh, the data frame with head and it gave me all this. So, so nothing's really changed so far uh, with what I've done. And again, you know, all the data that's in here, there's, there's 30 columns. Okay, 30. That's a lot. Imagine trying to do this in 30 D, 30 dimensions. Okay, and it's only showing the five rows. So there's a lot of stuff in here, right? And this is what we talked about. How do we get this down to the most important things? And one of the things that we've done with this is the pre-processing uh, standard scalar. Because if you look at the values, they go, you know, this one's uh, 20, uh, this one's 135, uh, and then we get down to like 0 0.1, right? So when we're looking at this data, we want to scale it down. And we've done that before in previous videos. Okay. So um, we're doing this scaler and we're, we're doing a fit on the data. Everything's working kind of as it should be. And now I have an error because I didn't run the previous cell. It's the one thing about Jupyter Notebooks, right? Now I want to run this one here. And what you're noticing here is that I've got uh, two components, okay, two components that I want to run. And you can kind of see the uh, notes, um, you know, try not to go above four components. Um, and the, the note is, you know, when you're showing other people, if you're talking about your data and you're trying to visualize your data with somebody else, don't go above four components. You know, obviously try to stay below two. But for what we talked about previously, we only really want to deal with two. Okay, uh, so I've scaled the data and you can see I've got two components. And, you know, if we think back to the example that we've been talking about, what I'm saying is I want to just deal with uh, two PCAs. Okay, I want uh, PCA1, PCA2. Okay, that's all I want to deal with. So that's really what I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm going to transform the data Okay, and when I transform this data, I can look at the shape and realize, okay, it's still uh, 569 and it's 30 columns. Um, but now that I've done the transformation here, uh, you can see that I'm only really dealing with two columns here. Okay, uh, this one here is where we're saying, um, you know, what I'm doing with this is just kind of trying to shape the size of my plot. Okay, so I'm just going to use that eight and six. Uh, and I'm saying just get, uh, you know, all the rows and specify the columns. And my targets for this um, are, are cancer is targets and plasma. Okay, so that's what I want here. So you can see I've got my first PC and my second PC. That's what my axes are. And, and this is a very nice and neat uh, example, but we're going to actually get into something uh, more detailed. Okay, uh, and then you're, you're just looking at all the, really, the, the samples in here, okay? Uh, and I want you to know that this particular one isn't so much about giving us uh, a prediction right now. Uh, this is more, um, we're, we're looking at some correlations in here. 
Okay, so that's really what this does. So I what I do want to do is just kind of walk away from this one and go look at a, an example more in line with uh, what we did before. And in case you're wondering, this is a heat map which produces this particular graph here. Okay, and then you can see all of the uh, the different features inside this data set or the columns um, that we're looking for. Okay, uh, or that we're at least comparing. So let's get out of here and uh, go and start a new a new project altogether. All right, so obviously it's a brand new um, problem and we're going to talk about some genetics and, uh, you know, genetics as instead of our variables, they're going to be um, number of genes, let's say. OK, and I don't mean uh, Levi's. Okay, so obviously the first thing I've got is a bunch of imports that I'm going to want to use, right? Uh, and I'll just, some of them I'm just going to copy and paste in and some I'll, I'll type in. Uh, but I've got, you know, my normal pandas, uh, numpy, and this one here is random as rd. Okay, and then I've got a couple others uh, I think I'm going to put in. Uh, probably good to have my... Um, matplotlib uh, pyplot as plt and you know from our sklearn we've got a couple things we want to put in there so from sklearn sorry uh sk sklearn dot decomposition is what i'm looking for so decomposition uh import the uh pca Okay, next one I want uh, from sklearn is going to be um, pre-processing. So it's not a dot, it's just uh, pre-processing. And just like that. So we're going to use this random just so that we can randomly generate some data. And that's the point of that. And then decomposition uh, in pre-processing we'll get into as well. So the but the PCA um, from Scikit-Learn is the most common one um, within the uh, Scikit-Learn or SK SK-Learn. Um, so this is the one that we're going to stick to for this particular problem. Right here, I'm just going to do a note uh, generate uh, data. And I'll save this to a markdown and then I'll run it. Okay, we're into the next cell. And let's go look at this. Uh, look at the actual data itself. Okay, uh, because I don't want to get into literally uh, naming a whole bunch of genes, uh, like different genetic material genes, that kind of stuff, because A, I don't know any. Uh, what I'm going to do is just this idea. Uh, genes, uh, and that's going to equal in close brackets uh gene and then we're going to give it a, a number so i'm going to have a hundred of these things and we're just going to give it a, a number to be like okay gene one gene two gene three okay and this will be plus uh str and in here we're going to say i okay and then just outside of that bracket we're going to say four i in range and it'll be from one to a hundred. So one, uh, comma one Oh one. And I said it would be a hundred names. Um, but since we're starting at one to truly get a hundred different ones, we have to go up by one. If this was, uh, if we were starting off with zero, then we would say, uh, do this. But since we're, we're not doing that, um, we're sticking to this convention. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so now we're going to make an array of some uh, sample names as well. And I want to put in a note. Uh, WT is going to equal um, wild type. Um, and then KO is going to equal uh, knockout. Yeah, so knockout. So, and KO. Okay, so that you can kind of follow along with, with, with what is going on. So WT is going to equal. In fact, what I'll do is just take this line here. 
uh, copy, paste, and I'm going to make some modifications to this. So this will be uh, WT, same sort of thing for I in range, uh, and this will be to six. Okay, so we're going to have five different samples of that. Okay, and that should be KO. Okay, KO, and I'll and everything should be okay, except for this should be KO. Okay, so we're good there. So now what we're gonna do is actually create the data. So we're gonna say data, okay? And it's always a good idea to start on the right and then assign it to something on the left, but that's okay for now. So PD dot uh, data frame. And in, sorry. In brackets, we're going to say columns equals, okay, and we're going to use these stars uh, for WT and KO, okay, and you'll you'll kind of see what happens in the middle. If you're familiar with Unix or Linux or any of those, you'll kind of understand a little bit about what I'm doing with the stars. Uh, so it's going to be star uh, WT, okay, and comma, and then star... KO and just outside that bracket. Now I'm going to do um, right here. I'm going to put a comma and do index equals equals genes. Okay. And that should end that off. And before I go any further, what I want to do is just put in a comma uh, comment here. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is with the this star thing, I think I should explain it, is I want to get WT1, uh, WT2, uh, comma, uh, and just keep going. And I want WT all the way to six. Okay. But if I don't have the, the star the way I'm doing this, uh, what's going to happen is you'll end up, I will end up getting... Uh, something I don't want. I'll end up getting something like this. I'll get two arrays. Okay, and I don't want that. And, and this won't be WT, this will be KO, and this will be KO, and this will be, you know, KO, all the way up to six. So there'll be two separate arrays, uh, which is not at all what I want to have. Okay, and it'll end up looking like that. So by putting in the stars, what happens is I can get rid of this and just do the comma um, and then just have one straightforward single array. And what that's going to represent is all of my columns. OK, so that's why I've got the stars in there. And the gene uh, names here are literally going to be like our in back in the slides when we're talking about uh, variable one, variable two, variable three. So that's what those are going to represent for us. Okay, and that's all coming from here. So it, it tells us that we're going to have at least 100 rows inside of this. And the output of this should be uh, gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, all the way to gene 100. Okay. So I'm going to stay inside that cell and I'm going to say uh, four genes. Uh, actually, gene, I'm going to make this singular. Gene in data dot index. Okay, and because it's a for loop, don't forget your semicolon or your colon at the end. So we'll say data dot lock, all right? And then square brackets. And in here we'll say gene, comma, right? And then do your single quotes and we'll say WT1. Okay, and then we're gonna do a colon here. And then again, in single quotes, you'll say WT5. Okay, and then outside of that, we're going to say mp.random, okay, dot poison uh, with two S's. And that's a method call or a function call. And so we're going to say lamb uh, equals rd for random and if you're you know remember it's right here random so rd dot uh rand range 
Okay, and that's going to be 10, comma, 1,000. Okay, and then go outside of that, put your comma in there and say size equals 5. Okay, so obviously that's not the only line we got to do. We got to do one more um, for KO. So we're going to say copy, paste, and change this to KO. And KO. All right, and everything else about that looks the same. All right, so let's have a look at this and uh, see what we get. So the first one is going to be print. And inside print, we're going to say data dot head. Okay, and that's a method. And then we're going to do print a data dot um, shape. Okay, and that should be it. Let's run this. But I, what I want to do, though, is first I want to run it from the top and then see what happens, because obviously I've got an error. Okay, one small issue that I had with uh, my code and I just moved it in uh, was the fact that I had a little bit of a space here uh, and it didn't like that. Um, so I moved it in and it seemed to work okay now. So I'm happy with that. So we'll continue to run that. And you can see what, what I was talking about before. I've got WT1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we've got KO, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I've got gene one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and so on. So I've got 10 columns and I've got a uh, hundred rows in my data set. So if I were to just knock this out of there for a second and then rerun that, um, it's just gonna give me the shape for the moment. Okay, so what I could do is just, um, just type in this data. Um, see what happens. Sorry, I forgot the uh, print. Okay, so you can see that it, it breaks in the middle. Um, you don't need the the middle um, 90 rows and columns. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So let me just take this out of here, undo that, rerun it, and you can see we have uh, just the head. I'm going to put a comment, comment in here. Uh, center and gale pca all right uh and i'm going to put that as a markdown and run that as a as a comment okay so the way i want to do this it's actually quite simple it's just one line of code uh so we're going to do pre-processing dot scale okay and in here we're going to say uh data dot capital t Okay, so that's the that's the first thing. And then we're going to take the result of that and we're going to assign it to a variable called uh, scaled underscore data. Okay, and that's all we're going to do for that piece right now. Next thing I want to do is actually create a PCA object and then uh, have it do some some math in terms of the fitting. Okay, and then um, we're going to get the coordinates of the PCA scaled data. Okay, so let's just go ahead and do that. So uh, we'll say we're going to call um, create the object first. So we want to say uh, PCA call the method. Okay, and we're just going to assign that object now to uh, PCA in lowercase. So PCA, that's all I want to do with that. Um, Looks like I've got some formatting. Okay, so we're good now. So now let's do a, a quick fit. Okay, so uh, PCA.fit. And inside here, it's just gonna be scaled uh, data. Okay, so this is where some math is gonna get done under the cover. And now we say PCA underscore uh, data. Okay, and this is going to be equal to uh, PCA dot transform uh, T R A N S. Let's see if it picks it up. No, nope, not picking it up yet. Uh, transform. Okay, and what do we want to transform? We want to transform our scaled data. 
Okay. Okay, so back in this line here, uh, doing this scaling. So uh, we're scaling and we're centering at the same time with this uh, this function call. Okay, so um, after the, the centering, the average value for each gene, okay, for each of these uh, is going to be zero. And then after scaling, the standard deviation for the values for each gene is going to actually be set to one. Okay, so... Uh, this is what we talked about in the slide where we we set that hypotenuse, not the hypotenuse, sorry, um, part A to uh, 1. Or another way of saying that is the Egan vector is going to be set to 1. So one note that I would like to make about this, about the transpose, and we've, we've done this in a previous video when we were talking about uh, matrix multiplication and stuff like that. Uh, what's happening here is that... Um, we're, we're transposing our data, okay? So the, the scale function expects the sample to be a row instead of a column. And that's kind of the, the only issue here. It's expecting it to be uh, in this direction as opposed to this direction as a column. And, and so that's why we're doing that. Uh, and we're using our, our samples as columns, okay? In the example, um, because it's kind of how I guess that's that works with um, with genetics. Um, you know, if yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, because I'm not a geneticist. I'm just working with the data. There's one other way we could have kind of done this, and I'm just going to put it as a as a note. Okay, uh, really, we could have done we could have done this as well, which would have been more more common. Um, we could have done standard. Uh, scalar. Like this, and then dot uh, fit uh, underscore uh, transform. And then in here, data T. Okay, we could have done it this way, right? But I'm just going to stick with uh, what I've got. Now, this last piece here, uh, this is actually going to uh, handle our, our loading scores, okay? Um, and it's also going to the variations that we were talking about earlier. So we've got variations and loading scores that are all gonna kinda get taken care of right here in, in this line of code. Sorry, it was, it's not just this one. It's actually the combination of two. They do more, um, they do a lot of the heavy lifting for us, which is really, really good. But it's both of them sort of in combination. It's incorrect to say that this one is doing everything. Okay, so really technically speaking, all three of these lines are, are needed to do this. It's this last line here. Um, that's where we're generating those coordinates for the PCA graph. Uh, and that's coming from our actual loading scores in our scale data. So all three of these things together, I can't stress enough, are pretty darn important. What I wanna do next is I'm in the next cell below and I wanna start doing one of those these scree plots, okay? Uh, because I, I wanna start getting a, a, a look at some of this, but we have a little bit of code to do before we can start looking at things. Uh, but it's still, uh, you know, Let's get into to looking at the scree plot. And we're going to do one label per principal component on this. Okay, so uh, let's start writing. So what I do want to do now is do the uh, percent uh, variation. Uh, I could have said just percent bar, but we'll go with that. Uh, percent variation. I just want it to be a little more clear. So MP dot uh, round. Um, and then inside this, this function, we're going to say, uh, PCA dot, uh, explained variance ratio. So EX, let's see. Okay. So there it is. Uh, explained variance ratio. Okay. And that will be multiplied. Oops. Multiplied by 100. Okay. And then a comma will say, uh, decimal 
equals one. So one decimal place. So that's the first piece. So that's going to do the percentage of the variation for each principal component. So now let's do some labels. Uh, we'll say labels uh, will equal square brackets, single quotes, uh, PC, and then plus uh, STR in brackets, X, and then uh, or X in range, okay, in brackets again, we're going to say one comma uh, length. I don't know why it's got a star. Uh, so no, I don't want that one there. I want the uh, I'm missing an R. I want this one. Right in there. And then I want to actually do a plus one. So next thing we're going to do uh, in order to visualize this is, is use um, matplotlib to create a bar plot. OK, so we, we often use it for scatter plots and stuff. We're going to use it as actually as a as a bar. OK, so it'll be plt bar dot bar. Sorry, not nut bar dot bar x equals range um, range. And then in here, we're going to say one uh, comma length. And in here, it's this percent variation again. P-E-R-C uh, percent variation. OK, and then plus one on the other side of that bracket. Go outside of the bracket and do a comma. And then we're going to say hi, uh, H-E-I-G-H-T equals uh, P E R percent variation, comma, uh, tick underscore. Let's see if it does tick label. No, nope. uh, tick label, uh, is going to equal labels. Okay. Which is what we've already done there. Now let's start doing the Y label and then the X label. So PLT dot um, Y label, Y label, and that's going to say um, a percent of uh, explained variance. Um, let's do this percent. I don't know if it'll take a okay percent of plain variance. Okay, that's the first one, and let's do the Y, and we'll change it. And we'll change this to X. And this should say, instead of that, we're going to say principal component. Or PC. Okay, and then we're going to do uh, the title. The title is going to be plt dot title um, title. We'll say uh, three. Last thing is, let's show this. Let's see what it looks like. Uh, plt dot show. OK, let's uh, let's run this from the top, though, just to be uh, not annoyed by errors. See, got an error, but we still got this plot. OK. Very simple error there. I just misspelled this. OK, and let's run it. OK, so look at what we're we've got. Look at the size of PC one versus every other one. OK, so uh, pretty significant. Uh, that the majority of uh, the number is is almost to 100% if you just kind of look at the scaling. To me, that looks like it's probably at least 95. So what this really means is that the uh, a 2D graph of our data, okay, um, should be really well represented 
of the original data using PC1 and PC2. So if we combined this PC1 and this PC2, um, we're going to have a really, really good representation of our original data. So for another sort of visual effect of this, what I want to do is draw a PCA plot. Okay, and we're going to put the new coordinates uh, created by the PCA transforms uh, that, you know, that we scaled uh, just previous. And we're going to put that into a matrix uh, where the rows have uh, sample later labels and columns have uh, PC labels. Okay, so let's look at this again. We're going to say uh, PCA underscore data frame. Okay, and we'll do... Uh, PD dot data frame, data frame. And then in here, we're going to say uh, PCA underscore data. Okay. And then a comma, and then we'll say index. And this is going to equal to a square bracket. Uh, again, star W T comma star K O. And then we'll we'll just step outside that square bracket, put in a comma, and we're going to say columns labels. So columns uh, equals labels. Okay. Okay. And the next thing now I want to do is just a straight up uh, scatter plot. So PLT scatter. And in here, what we'll do is this particular one, right? This new PCA, uh, PCA DF. So copy this, uh, drop that in there. And, but I want to call dot uh, PC1, or this is what I'm, I'm using it with. I'm not calling it, it's not a method. Okay, so PCA um, underscore, uh, I want DF dot uh, PC2. Okay, and the next line is going to be plt dot uh, title and uh, PCA graph. How about that? PCA graph. Okay, and then uh, let me go up here and just edit some of this. It'd be nice and easy to do it that way. Uh, of course not. It's not even the same code, so maybe I won't do it that way. So plt. Um, let's say X label. Now, keep in mind, this is an important point, right? PC one is our X label. Okay. That's what we want along the X horizontal axis. Okay. Cause remember it's, it's the highest weighted. They're the largest number. So we want that to be in the right axis. So, uh, inside of label. Uh, what we're going to say is uh, PC1, PC1, okay, and a dash, and we'll do these brackets with a zero, and then just outside of it, put a percent, okay? Uh, that's just some formatting stuff. Uh, format, and inside format, say um, it's PER uh, percent variation, okay? And inside here, we're going to say the first one. Okay, now I can copy and paste and do some edit on that one. Okay, this will be Y. This will be 1. And this will be 2. Okay, so we should be good for those. All right, and now I'm going to do a uh, 4 sample in... PCA uh, underscore DF dot index. Okay. And because it's a for loop, I've got a, a colon uh, PLT dot annotate. Okay. So annotate. And then here we'll say uh, sample, sample, comma, another bracket. We're going to say PCA underscore and I want DF dot PC one. Okay. Dot L O C for location and square brackets. And we'll say sample. Okay. Do a comma. 
And we're going to do the same thing again for the other one. So I can take all of this, copy, paste, change this to two, and I'm good. Okay, and then the last thing I want to do is get out of that for loop and do uh, plt.show. And that's it for that. And let's have a look at this. Okay. So there. Um, interesting stuff that's going on. And so what does this really mean? You know, honestly. Uh, so when I look at this, what it, it says to me that on the uh, left hand side, the KO, it's correlated with each other. Okay, because it's sort of clustered on the same side. The WTs are also uh, correlated with each other. Um, so you can see that clear division between the two um, samples. And you can also see uh, this percentage. 92.9 for PC1 and uh, 1.7 for PC2. Now, if you add up 92.7 and 1.7, you don't get 100%. Don't forget there was other PCs in there, but these were the, the most um, the most prevalent between the two. So it we're looking for two axes, so we're taking the one with the second highest value. So this was the first one, this was the second highest value. So that's why we're using PC1 and PC2. Now, this also tells us something else. It tells us that we're spread out, sorry, uh, horizontally across the x-axis, right? It's not really like the clustering is happening. Yes, there's a, a vertical component to this, but we're really spread out horizontally. And then these are just staying in two sort of a column. So it's important to understand um, that, you know, based on those loading scores, we can determine that the genes had the largest influence, uh, you know, when we separated the two clusters across the X axis. So that's really what we're trying to say is that the, the greatest influence of the clusters is when they're spread horizontally along the X axis. I want to take a, a second here to and look at loading scores, All right? So uh, we're going to just create these. Okay, loading scores is going to be uh, the way we can do this is with uh, PD series. And in here I can say uh, PCA dot uh, components. And you'll notice that there's an underscore at the end of component. And I just want to check, you know, do it in the uh, the first one. And then we'll say index equals genes. Okay. So, you know, my goal is to get the name of the top 10 measurements uh, or the top 10 genes that contribute contributed most to PC1. Okay. Uh, and then once I do that, I'm going to do some sorting, uh, and that's going to be based on magnitude. Okay. And then once I, I do that, I'm going to get the names of the top 10 genes. Okay. And then we're going to print them out. Okay. So once we kind of get through that, I, I think we, we're going to be able to wrap this up a little bit. Uh, it's going a little bit long, but that's okay. Um, you know, we're kind of learning something new. So the next thing I do want to do is, uh, let's say sorted underscore loading uh, scores. Sorted loading scores, and it's going to just be uh, loading, loading scores dot ABS absolute value. Okay. And then dot sort. Okay, and it should actually, um, let's do it this way, uh, sort, do I want sort loaded scores? No, I don't think I want it this way. I want sort, uh, nope, sorry, it keeps doing that. I want sort, uh, values, 
sort values, and then let's say ascending. No, um, doesn't want to play ball with me. Ascending equals false. Uh, hopefully that's not going to throw any errors. Let's do top 10 uh, genes. Okay, and that's going to be uh, sorted loading scores. And we'll just do it in this array. So one top 10 outside the bracket. And then we're going to do index dot values. Okay, and then finally, what we need to do is just print loading scores, uh, 10 genes. Okay, so we'll say print um, loading scores, loading scores, and in here, we're going to say top 10. Top 10 genes. Hopefully that's going to work. And let's see what happens. Ah, look at that. Amazing. Okay. Um, so this is what our, our top 10 most influential genes actually turn out to be. Let's look at this for a minute. Uh, this, you know, PC1 is going to be known as index zero, and that's why I, I'm, I'm going with this. Uh, so it's, un it's important to understand that for components, um, principal component one is set to index zero. Okay, so at, at the end of the day, did we use this to make a prediction of any kind? No, no, we didn't. We really didn't do that. Um, but what we were able to do is actually take this, this data and identify what was the very most influential data um, that we had in all of our samples. Okay, so that's really what the the overall point of doing this is. Uh, it's pretty important to understand what's going on with this. Uh, and I know it was a long drawn out sort of explanation just to get to a couple of charts and stuff. Um, but, you know, hopefully you, you understood what was going on and how you can take uh, massive amounts of data and just kind of focus in, on the most important pieces of data that you've got. Okay, so from here, if you wanted to develop this any further on some sort of a, a machine learning uh, algorithm, you know that you have now a list of the most important features that you can start doing, uh, making some prediction on. Okay, so anyway, I, I'm going to knock off the video there. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll we'll see you when we see you. Okay, thanks. Bye.